wake up my soul, wake up for I believe I will wake in the dawn with my soul. Thank the Lord in front of His people. I'm singing You praises among the nations. For Your unfailing love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches up to the clouds. For Your Failing love is higher than the heavens That's why I lift up my head The more I lift you up The more I lift you high The more I want to serve you More and more The more I have your peace The more I have your joy The more I want to give you All of my love Yes, in the morning I will remember All of my praises to unto you, for you are my Lord. Mm. Wake up, my soul, wake up, oh, I believe. I will wake in the dawn with my soul. Thank the Lord in front of his people. I'm singing you praises among the nations. For oh, your Failing love is higher than the heavens Your faithfulness reaches up to the cloud For your unfailing love is higher than the heavens That's why I lift up my hands The more I lift you up The more I lift you high The more I want to serve you More and more The more I have your peace The more I have your joy The more I want to give you all of my love Yes, in the morning I will remember All of my praises Do unto you Yes, in the morning I will remember All of my praises Do unto you For you are my Lord You are my Lord You are my Lord shelter in your name Jesus only light on the shore only hope in the storm Jesus let me fly to your side there I would hide of my heart the pulse and the measure of my unbelief speak your words to me before I come apart help me believe in what I cannot see before the river runs away I will call upon your name Jesus Only light on the 
shore, only hope in the storm. Jesus, let me fly to your side. There I would hide. Oh, Jesus, only a light on the shore. Only hope in the storm Jesus Let me fly to your side There I would hide Jesus mm. Welcome everyone to our online service at Charisma Church, Hamilton, Ontario. I'm Pastor Victor and we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to share God's word with you today. And we are going to be studying the letter that the Apostle John had written in the Bible. It's 2 John. If you open up your Bibles, we're going to be continuing our series on one chapter. There are five books in the Bible that have one chapter. And today we're going to be reading John's epistle called Second John. And as we are opening up our Bibles to be prepared, I was thinking about, in preparation for this uh, message, uh, of the importance of writing something. Uh, I encourage uh, discipleship groups to uh, think about writing something that you would want to say to the world on your behalf in your relationship with God. And don't worry, it doesn't need to be perfect. It's just something that you wanna put on paper and you can read it to one another at your discipleship groups at the last uh, session that we're going to be studying, session five. Today is session three. And I was thinking about even myself years ago, uh, I, around Christmas time, uh, I would, uh, actually write little letters to each of my kids uh, during Christmas time. And while well, they were kind of adults already, um, the, the, the family has grown since then. Um, but it was fun to let them read back something that I had written to each of them on my behalf or for each of those children. So I encourage you to do that because it's interesting that we have five books in the Bible that there is just one chapter and we want to, uh, to study this one chapter, 2 John, today. And uh, speaking of this book, uh, we don't actually see John identifying himself in name, but he uses the word elder in the first verse. And this is, this is um, nothing new. Peter, the apostle, in his epistle, he addressed himself also as elder. So we can assume quite comfortably that this is indeed written by the Apostle John himself. Let me read from Peter's epistle in chapter five, uh, his first epistle, he says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings. So Peter, though he doesn't use his name, but we can see that he's addressing himself as elder. And you will see here in the first verse that John is referring to himself as elder. Where are, are we in terms of when this is, was written and where John may have been? Uh, generally, approximately, we can place this book written between 70 AD and 100 AD. Uh, but because of the letter's similarity to the first uh, letter of John, uh, we can narrow it down to when John was exiled to the island of Pet Petmos. And so that would bring us to around 90 uh, AD. And interestingly, John addressed this letter, as we're going to see here, to the chosen lady and her children. Now, this is a mysterious phrase that has been debated over the years between Bible scholars uh, because it could refer to an actual woman and her family, or it may be a metaphor. And what I mean by metaphor is it could 
perhaps represent the, the church at large. Uh, example, the, the bride of Christ and her disciples. Uh, so this uh, debate has been discussed among Bible scholars over the years, but the text seems to lean towards more to the, to the, the person or the literal person. There, in, I, in either case, it's, it's not so much um, what side we take on, but the importance of the message. But it does seem to be that he is writing to a specific family, a specific woman, and family. And as often we do, we like to take a key verse uh, to apply to the message so we can refer to that key uh, verse to, to hold the message together. And the one that I have brought out today is the words of Jesus found in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. And I want to speak th about two specific words here that we are going to see prominent in John's letter to this woman and her children. Uh, it's the word love and the word truth. Love and truth. Now let's listen to the words of Jesus. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So we see love and truth. And so I see here in this letter in John that he's calling us to focus. Uh, and so I want to bring three particular points that we want to teach on what we should be focusing on as we're listening to the reading of this letter. Number one, the, the stress of protecting the, f the fellowship of, of uh, God's people from false teaching or falsehood. John really brings this out strongly in this message. So that sense of protection. And the reason is, is because love, if you love, you protect. That's the nature of God's love or agape love. The second focus point that I bring here that I see is the importance of love and to love one another, John is saying. And it's keeping a command of Jesus to love in this way. And the third focal point that I see here in this letter is about being wise in about relationships. Relationships are to be building and to be strengthening, to be refreshing one another, much like we are doing today as we are uh, and listening to the Word of God together. And so in Proverbs chapter 3, we see the, the importance of focusing on the one who is truth and the one who is love. God is the source of love and God is the source of truth. And so there must be one source of this. And then we are called to submit. Mankind is called to submit under this truth and this love. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, it reads, In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. This, is, this truth is for all of mankind. It calls us to submit because he is love and he is truth. And we are going to see this in John's letter as we read today. So let's ask this question. What does uh, the Apostle John want the letter to focus on? Let's read this letter and then we'll break this down in three points. The elder to the lady chosen by God and to her family or her children, whom I love in truth. And you're going to hear this word love and truth repeated over this letter. And not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth, which lives in us, we will be and will be with us forever. This truth will be with us forever, in eternity. This truth that John is writing about. Verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Truth and love bring forth from heaven grace and mercy, and peace. Praise his holy name. We, we love grace, we love mercy, and we love peace. It all comes from the source, which is God our Heavenly Father, and from Jesus Christ, 
and it will be with us forever. So he goes on to establish these truths. And then he goes on to, to warn the church, to warn the family, to warn this mother, whom in the truth he expresses love. In verse 4, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. Just as the Father commanded us, commanded us to walk in the truth and love. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I'm not telling you to do something new. You received the gospel because you heard that God so loved the world that he gave you his only son. That if you believe on him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. John is not changing anything. He's going back to the roots of the truth. And this woman heard the truth, and that truth set her free, and her children free. So he's not deviating from the truth. He's reestablishing the roots of the truth, which is God the Father who sent his Son to save the world. Now watch what he says here. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his commands is that you walk in love. It's amazing how everything goes back to the command of walking in love, because that's what Jesus commanded. In verse 7, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh has gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist, or opposes Christ's message. Then the spirit of Antichrist, John writes in his first letter, in verse 8, watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. The apostles were chosen by Christ to teach and apply the truth and work at it so that they would see the fruits of their labor. And he's reminding them, don't forget the work that we have done because deceivers have gone into the world trying to rob this truth, trying to nullify what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. In verse nine, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the father and the son. So beloved, he is reaffirming that this truth that he has received, it came from God, it did not come from himself. And he's saying these others that run ahead, they may be deceiving, they they are deceiving. And he is saying, you got to go back to your roots. you got to go back to the author and the perfecter of your faith. Do never forget that. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. And those those are strong words. But beloved, it's because he is protecting the gospel because God so loved the world. So he's being bold and saying, anybody comes in that's not from God, anybody that's deceiving, anybody that's taking away that truth, that is not from the Spirit of God. So he has to be strong. He has to be bold in this to discern what is true and what is false. In verse 12, he writes, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister who is chosen by God sent their greeting. So here's a letter. And he finishes off simply by saying, there's more that I want to write to you, but instead of writing, I want to see you and talk to you face to face. And this is kind of the conclusion of today's message is the importance of relationships. Because relationships with the body of believers, it brings joy and it brings refreshment. And this is what John is saying. I have a lot to write, but he put mostly the important things on one chapter but he wants to see them face to face. So I want to bring three points, beloved, here in uh, today's message. Number one, in verse nine, we see, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. So he draws a clear line. And what it shows me in John's spirit, in John's heart, in his forthrightness, is that he's protecting the gospel. So he's teaching us to focus on protecting the fellowship from falsehood. I remember uh, seeing a Facebook post 
And it really alarmed me and it disturbed me in my spirit, if you don't mind me saying so, that um, in, in the White House in America, they have what's called a, a prayer breakfast or a breakfast prayer. They get together and they have a time to pray. And we were listening to this prayer and this pastor, uh, whoever this individual was, would not acknowledge the true God or the triune God, the, the one who had given us his only son. And if it's not the truth, if it's not God's truth, then it's false. And yet they are allowing this type of prayer to be advocated in a free country where if it was not for the grace of God, we would not enjoy this freedom in the Western world. This is the danger. If we allow false doctrine to come in and seep in, when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one cometh unto the Father except through me. This is God speaking to the world. And yet in these wonderful, these little subtle, wonderful settings, False doctrine can be introduced to say things that are not true or anti-Christ. John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, not man's spirit, the Holy Spirit. He would teach us the truth. Now, how do we know that truth by the Holy Spirit? There's only one way, and that's what we're going to see in Scripture, how man can understand what is true. Because it's not man's own spirit by himself that understands these things that are true. But the Holy Spirit sent from heaven to live into man's spirit by faith. And by faith in Jesus Christ who came to save us from the power of sin and condemnation. This is why Jesus writes like this, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. There you see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus describes his nature, the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things and he will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Jesus comes in the flesh. He pays the punishment of mankind's sin. He buries them in the grave. He takes the punishment of sin, which is the wages of sin is death. But death could not hold him down. No, the Holy One would not allow to see him rot in the grave. No, God raised him from the dead on the third day, as the scriptures foretold. And he appeared to his disciples. We, we witnessed this, we share this on Easter, this proclamation of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what does he say? He says, I will not leave you as orphans, but the Holy Spirit will come. I will ask the Father and the Father will send you the Holy Spirit and will remind you everything that I said. So in bodily form, God came in the flesh. In bodily form, God ra raised from the dead in the person of Jesus Christ. And in bodily form, he was raised into heaven. You know, I was looking up in the sky and I was thinking to myself, what? an amazing view that those disciples had to see Jesus Christ ascending into heaven. And two angels were there comforting the disciples and said, the same way that you have seen him ascend, the same way he will come again in the last day. Can you imagine the witness of these apostles? And this is why we need to lean on those that have witnessed him, the resurrected Jesus Christ, in the flesh, because he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. What happened on the day of Pentecost? As the disciples were praying, indeed, Jesus would be praying to the Heavenly Father, just like he said, I will ask the Heavenly Father and he will send you the Holy Spirit. And here it comes on the day of Pentecost. And the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. And Peter went and proclaimed the gospel. And 3,000 of them were saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the point I bring, bring, here, bring here, beloved, is that love protects. We see this in John's spirit. He, he loves the church. He loves the church. Like we love the church. And when we love the church, we protect. And Paul loved the church. Now, Paul hated the church. But when he encountered Christ in heaven and Christ appeared to him, 
on the road to Damascus to persecute the church, he was blinded. And on the third day, when Ananias prayed for him, scales came off of his eye. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know what? Paul loved the church. Paul understood the true living God. He was changed. He was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he writes to the church of Galatia in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He is expressing the same kind of that grievance that John, the apostle, is writing from the island of Patmos. Because Paul understood, too, that they were deceivers coming into the Galatian church and, and giving them a false gospel, a gospel that did not portray Christ crucified for their sins and Christ risen from the grave. That's what you need to believe in. No, they would start adding things or, or, or twisting things. And he writes like this, you foolish Galatians. Now watch what he speaks about the Holy Spirit. Who has bewitched you? You see, Paul connects the work of Christ Jesus on the cross with the power of the Holy Spirit. Those two, those two things you can never divide. The Holy Spirit will always be present when the preaching of Christ crucified is present. That's where you have the Holy Spirit. And when there's faith in that message, the Holy Spirit comes into that believer and marks them with salvation. And this is why Paul is upset and says to them, you foolish Galatians, he has heard they're believing another gospel. Who has bewitched you? And you know, the word bewitched is demonic. It is anti-Christ. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I, Paul, saw him rip over the clouds of heaven and he appeared to me. And I know Peter, I know Simon, I know the, I know the, other, uh, the other apostles who have witnessed him, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And I, Paul was portraying him with my words, compelling you to understand this is true. I would like to learn just one thing from you, he says. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law, by trying to work it out by yourself, by obedience to the law? Or how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit by believing what you heard? That's why Romans says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you shall be saved. Children can understand this. Amen. And the point I bring here, beloved, is that we have the responsibility passed down to us by early disciples to keep the gospel simple so that our children can understand it. God so loved your children like he loves you that he gave them God's son so that when they believe on him, they will not perish, but have everlasting life. Many things are going to be taught to children. They, at some point, are going to understand, I need Jesus. How are they going to know they need Jesus? It's from you. It's from the church. It's from us. We need to protect that faith and share that to the children. When that day comes of trial and they're asking questions about life, because we have sown the truth into their life, they know who to call upon Jesus. Jesus is alive, so they will know, Jesus, you are there for me. Can I hear an amen, church? Now, let's read verses 5 through 6. And we're going to set this, this next point that John is expressing. He's going back to the commands of Jesus to say, listen, I'm not giving you new instruction. The way to, to serve God and the way to walk in this life because we have been saved through faith in Jesus, is to love one another. Now watch what he says in verse 5 and 6. Now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in the way of love. That was Jesus' command. That was the purpose that he came. God expressed himself through the perfect work of Christ on the cross. This is how God expressed love. That's what it took to save us, that Jesus Christ would take the punishment on his body for our sins. That's why Jesus said, is there any other way? No, God so loved you that Jesus was willing to obey the will of his Father because he loves you. And that's what it took, beloved. That's agape love. So John is reminding us to focus on Jesus' command to love one another. Always remember to love one another because that's the root of this gospel. God so loved the world 
John began his uh, second epistle proclaiming his love when he said to the elder, to the lady chosen by, uh, by God. And he said that truthfully because the word says that Jesus chose us. We didn't choose him. It was by the grace of God that, that you heard the message of the gospel. He chose you. This is why he is saying here, the lady chosen by God. God in his rich mercy, John is telling her, God chose you, lady, and we love you in the truth and her children. And he says, who I love in the truth. You have rejoiced in the truth of this gospel. I love this in the truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. You see, what encompasses this message in John's heart is everyone that comes and receives this gospel. He says, ah, wow, I, all those that have come into this truth I love because we have been, been brought into this or bought into this family by the precious blood of Jesus. And we are a family that learns to love one another through the grace of God and his Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, he will remind you of the things that I have said, the Holy Spirit. It's no wonder the Holy Spirit nudges on our hearts and says, forgive as you have been forgiven or be kind as your heavenly father has been gracious and kind and merciful to you. And the reason why, beloved, that we need to express our faith in Christ is because the message is about God becoming man or God becoming us in our frailty in the person of Jesus Christ. He discarded his heavenly privileges to become a servant and obedience to the will of his heavenly father, even to the point of crucifixion. So this is the, the anchor of our soul, that Jesus Christ came from heaven to become man for us. And so this is true agape love. There is no love deeper, wider, longer, and higher than the love of Christ. This is why John speaks about, listen, there are liars, they're deceivers. Why? Because they don't love you. They are coming in, infiltrating the church, and they're saying things, but they have selfish motives. It's not for you. They don't love you. They don't come from the Spirit of God. They're anti-Christ. They are opposed to this message because they are false. They have not given their hearts over to the true living God. They don't understand they are sinners, and they need a Savior. And so if they're coming to you, they're coming to you with wrong motives. In verse 7, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, have gone out into the world, and any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. When we refer to Jesus' commands, he always reminds us the command to love. In John chapter 13, verse 34, a new command I give you, because all of the commands under the Mosaic law, it was do this and do that, and they are all holy. And Jesus comes and says, a new command, because he has come in the flesh. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Now this is agape love. So you must love one another. And the reason why he says it's a command, you must is because sometimes that is challenged. As we often say, humanistic love has limits, but God's love is limitless, and he is the supply of that agape love. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. They ask him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Now, I happen to have here a little hanger. And he says, this is, this is the command to love. And he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands, to love God and to love one another. Now, when I have to be honest with you, and if you're honest with yourself, have we always obeyed this law of love to love God with all our hearts and all our mind and all our strength? I, I confess, no, not all the time. I failed in there. Have I always obeyed to love my neighbor as myself? No, I've failed at that many, 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 many times. 
And here he says, Jesus says, this is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And the reason he's saying it's hanging here is because without this, you see, it's interesting that Jesus comes in the flesh and the word says that the law was fulfilled in his, in his life. He fulfilled the law. He says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So he showed us what the law was for in his perfect life, the spotless lamb. And when we speak about the lamb, the prophets foretold of the Messiah. When we read Psalm 22, and when we read Isaiah 9, and when we re read Isaiah 53, and when we read the book of Daniel, in, and we tie that to Revelation, we see the prophets. Uh, and we see Jesus often refer to the Psalms and the prophets saying, they wrote about me. And it brings us back to this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son because we have all broken the law. And the prophets foretold this, that we needed a Messiah. All the law and the prophets hang on this. This is what Jesus says. And it's interestingly, beloved, that Jesus was hung on a cross for our sins. Praise be his holy name. And that's why we celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the point here I bring here, beloved, is that only the gospel can truly, in our hearts, transform a person because he said the Holy Spirit will come in you and he will remind you of everything that I have said. Let me bring up this last point. In verse 10, the apostle John writes in this letter, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Those are bold words to say, but it's because again, we're driving home that love protects. Because especially in that time, and it still goes on today, and it, as a matter of fact, it's increasing today, these ideas of who God is. Back then, we had what was called Gnosticism, and it's carried on that false teachers would proclaim that essentially Jesus, you know, he wasn't God in the flesh that came in bodily form, but he was, he appeared to be a man, and he raised, but not in bodily form, but he raised, but more about like a spirit ghost when when Jesus actually appeared to his disciples and, and he said to Thomas, he says, look, touch my hands. And there were the wounds in his hands and on his side. And when Thomas touched those wounds, he proclaimed, my God, my Savior, my Lord. And Jesus said, look, you know, a ghost doesn't have flesh and blood. This is God that has come to this earth in the form of man. And so the last point bring, I bring here, beloved, is to focus on being wise about relationships. This is what John, uh, John is saying. Now, we are not saying that we, you know, uh, we're living in a bubble and insulated. And that's not what he's saying. Jesus went and he, he sat with sinners and tax collectors. Let's understand what John is saying. It's those that come and they try to be the teacher over the gospel and try to quash the gospel, silence the gospel. That's what John is saying. Be careful what you're listening to and the relationships that you're getting your advice from when it comes to spiritual matters. You know, I showed a clip a while ago on a Sunday morning that Jesus has commissioned us uh, on a mission. And, you know, he said to Simon Peter, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, and so I kind of related it to this clip that I showed on the Sunday where you'd see these fishermen on, on these boats and they were casting out their line and what do they want? They want to fish. And you know, they, they, the bigger the better, as they say. Uh, but in a funny way, you would often see the, the fish was kind of big on the line and instead of the fishermen dragging in the, the fish into the boat, the opposite would happen and that big fish would be pulling the fishermen into the lake. You don't want that to happen. That's not the purpose of going fishing, to be dra dragged into the ocean. But John is basically saying in a serious note here, he says, don't let people come into your life and let them drag you into something that God never intended you to be dragged into. No, be careful about those relationships that they can say things that are, that are not from God. He says, no, we need to be the ones pulling the lost into the found. That's the power of the message of the gospel. 
And I always say this um, frequently through my years of, of teaching is that ministry starts at home because it's, it's always about family. You know, Jesus said like this, as the, the Father has loved me, you know, Father and Son, so I have loved you. And so he's relating it to family. And no wonder he says, I go home to prepare a place for you, that where I am there, you may also be. What are you saying? He's saying, that's home. That's your heavenly father. I am your brother and I am your savior. So praise be his holy name that he's trying to make it very simple to say, home is with God. And so John is expressing in here is he loves the fellowship of believers. Now, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So this message needs to be proclaimed to everyone. But I always say this, it starts at home. You know, when we take a little pebble, you know, and we are sitting there by, by the lakeside, uh, we skip the rocks and you get, get to see that thing, or you throw it in there and you get to watch a rippling effect. So a little pebble has the, the power to, to, to make a ripple effect. If you remember a stone story in the Bible where there was this adulteress that was caught, she was brought into the circle, remember that? And everybody had a stone, the young ones and the old ones. And Jesus was in there writing in the sand and then he was with her, someone say with her, you know, and he was with her and he looks at them and they are asking him, what do you think? You know, the law says this. And, you know, I picked this up again. The law says, you know, about adultery, that they should be stoned to death. And they weren't lying. It's true. It's in the law. But then Jesus shows something and he says, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. And it's amazing what Jesus just says one word out of his lips. And everybody just, I disobeyed the law. I've disobeyed the law. So indeed, he was fulfilling the prophetic word, God is love. And love is expressed in forgiveness. Now he told her, don't, don't, go sin any, don't go sin anymore. Don't be doing that thing anymore. Follow me. And so indeed, we see in, later on in scripture that many scholars believe that she was one of them that God greatly used to witness the, the grace of Jesus Christ in scripture. And so... We have a choice to, to, to do what we want with, with a stone. We can, we, can, we can throw it in a way that these people wanted to throw it using the law. Or we can, as the scriptures say, be living stones. Make people feel alive. That's really the, the spirit of Christ's uh, work in us is be a living stone. Do something that will show an act of kindness. Even in the face of evil, especially in the face of evil. So what are the small things that you can do through you know, your life and your home? Small things that you can do to show, Lord, I want to be a living stone. I want to be someone partnering with you in building what you're building. That's why he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. So do small things that show rippling effects that you love God and you love. Because all the law and the prophets hang on this command to love. Amen. Amen. Next uh, Sunday, we're going to continue this teaching. And we're going to read John's third letter, which only has, again, one chapter. So stay tuned next Sunday. In the meantime, we gather here on Facebook and YouTube Tuesdays, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. at Refuel. Uh, and... Thursday mornings at 10 a.m., uh, Pastor Wellington and myself, we go deeper into Sunday's message. So we have Sunday mornings, Tuesday evenings, Thursday mornings, uh, Facebook. And so enjoy us uh, through the week. Stay connected. And speaking of staying connected, don't forget your discipleship groups. Reach out to them. I'm sure they're reaching out to you. Practice safety, okay, guys? But do your best to stay connected in a safe way to encourage one another's. Uh, faith. I ask you to just stay, uh, stay tuned after this uh, message, just to give you some information on the continuing guidance of how you can support uh, the ongoing needs of the local ministry at Charisma Church. May God bless you and keep you safe, and we are looking forward to unite again in this way. God bless you all.